Okay, here it is. After saying I was going to do it for forever, I'm finally doing it. A video explaining how I create some of the effects I use in my images, as well as a few other tips and tricks I utilize that will hopefully help you out with your own artwork. Quick disclaimer though, before getting right into it, all of the products that I'm going to mention in this list I do actually use, and I have for a long time, and none of them have actually sponsored me to promote them in any way. Okay, here's the list. First up is a pretty simple tip that a surprising number of people may not actually know that you can do. That's doing reverse image searches on Google with Google Lens. So, say you've been searching forever for an image of a character doing a particular pose you want to use in your artwork, and you finally find what you're looking for, but it's really small with low resolution. The first thing you can do is use Google Lens to do an image search for more instances of that image on the internet. So starting from the Google search page, come up here to images and then type in your search term. Then go to Tools, Size, and let's start with Large. This will show you options in the highest resolution. But if you can't find what you're looking for, just drop it down to Medium. Now if you find an image that'll work for you, you can just drag it to your desktop and open it. And here you can see it's really low resolution, lacking in a lot of detail, and has this pixelation noise. So what you want to do is drag that image from your desktop and drop it here where it says drop an image. And that'll bring up Google Lens. You can see here it's automatically selected what it thinks is the main subject of the image to search for, which is fine for this image since it's just a guy against a white background, but if the image had more going on in the background or it didn't select the right thing, just expand the selection to the whole image. Then hit Find Image Source. Here you can see the sizes that it's found, small, medium, and it would say large here if it had found a large enough version. So let's select medium and click the first image, and here we can see it's quite a bit larger than the previous version. So let's just drag that onto the desktop and have a closer look. And we can see it's definitely much higher resolution with more detail we can work with. Now, let's say you did all that and you still had no luck finding an image in the size you need and with the amount of detail that you can work with. You're not out of options yet because there's still AI image upscaling with Gigapixel AI. Now, I've tried a bunch of the online options for this, but found that easily the best and most versatile way to upscale images and recover details is with Gigapixel AI from Topaz Labs. Now, it's not free. Right now, it costs $100 US, but it frequently goes on sale, and you can also use the Honey Web extension to search for promo codes to get a discount. That's what I did, and I think I got it for like 75 bucks. Whatever you pay, though, it's totally worth it in my opinion, at least for the amount I use it. So here's how it works. From inside the program, you can load an image either by clicking here on Browse Images or by simply dragging and dropping an image from your desktop. I'm just going to drag in the image from the previous example and it'll apply some default settings. You can see it did a pretty good job adding back details just with these default settings, but as you can see, it had a little trouble here with the earlobe and the eyeball. Let's see if we can fix it while I take you through a few of these options real quick. So here is where you can select how much you want to increase the size of the image. 0.5x will decrease the size by half. I'm not real sure why you'd want to decrease the size of something with an image upscaler, but there's the option. This will increase twice the size, four times, and up to six times is the largest you can go. And here you can enter a custom increase amount. Next you have your different AI models. Standard is kind of the default and can work well for a variety of types of images. Lines is good for images of architecture, cityscapes, typography, or images with thick lines like line art. Art and CG is another option that's good for images that aren't photographs, like computer graphics, art drawings, or scans. Low resolution is best for images with blocky compression artifacts or digital noise. And very compressed is for images that are really small, with very low resolution. Now, even though each of these models was designed for specific uses, that doesn't mean you can't try each one of them on any type of image you want you'll often get great results using a model that was meant for a totally different use. Just try them and compare the results. 
For this image though, I'm just going to stick with the standard model. Now under settings here, if you have this option ticked, it's going to automatically adjust these two sliders down here to what it thinks are the best values for the image. Usually you can just stick to what it picks for you, but sometimes you may want to adjust them yourself. They're pretty self-explanatory. Suppressed noise will adjust how much it, well, suppresses noise. This applies to both digital compression noise as well as lumen noise, like you might see in a low light photo. Adjusting this too high might remove other details you want in an image, like skin texture, so just be sure to zoom in on the image when playing with it. And next is the remove blur. This basically acts as a sharpening slider. Again, make sure to zoom in when using it because you can accidentally add more noise in some images by putting this up too high. And again, for this example, I'm just going to leave it on the defaults. Lastly are these two additional settings. I get what color bleed is supposed to do. It's supposed to keep one color from bleeding into another when there's a gradient of pixels between what should be a hard line, such as this line between this jacket and shirt but I've rarely ever needed to use this and haven't seen it do much in the cases where I did, so just leave it unchecked. Face recovery, however, can sometimes work miracles. Now this will only be useful on images with faces, obviously, and it's really just a case of turning it on and adjusting the strength until you get a result that looks good for your image. On this image at 90%, you can see that it added a little more definition to the earlobe, completely fixed the issue with the eyeball, and even added some detail back into the beard and hair. So that's where I'm gonna leave it. From here, you just hit save image, select what format you want the image in, the quality, no reason not to keep this at 10, and the color profile. And then choose where you wanna save it and hit save. Now you have a high resolution and detailed image you can use in your artwork. The next item is a technique I use in a lot of my artwork called smudge painting, or smudge over painting. This is a great way to make your images look painted and is way more realistic looking than just using the oil paint filter in Photoshop. Though the oil paint filter can still have its uses as you'll see in a minute. I'm gonna use this portrait I took of writer Bill Bryson in London and just add an oil paint filter to it so you can kind of see the difference afterwards. Let's go up to filter, stylize, oil paint. And you can see that no matter where you put these sliders, it's gonna have this swirly pattern it adds that doesn't look realistic at all. And it's a dead giveaway whenever I see it that this is what the person used inside of Photoshop to try and get a quick painted look. Well, like so many things, to get the best results, you can't always take shortcuts. So to get started, we're just gonna make a duplicate of the base layer, then select a smudge brush. It's this little icon here. I have it bound to the S key in my workflow. The default soft round brush works just fine. All we're gonna do to modify it is flatten it and rotate it so that it's at just a little bit of an angle. The strength you'll need to set the brush to is gonna vary depending on the size and resolution of the image you're working on. If the strength is too low, it'll be too hard to get it to smudge. You'll have to go over it over and over before it does anything. And if it's set too high, it'll smudge too much and just make a blurry mess. You want it to be just hard enough so that it smudges in a more controllable way. It's kind of hard to explain, you just have to feel it really. But for example, this image is 3744 by 2498 with the resolution at 300 pixels per inch. And the sweet spot for me is a strength of 30%. Now for whatever reason, I always start at the nose on people. What you want to do is smudge the areas that have the same lightness value first. See how I'm working around the highlight? You don't want to blend that into the darker areas. You want to work around it first, then smudge just that area. You also want to follow the contours and lines of the face and not smudge in between them. Leave the hairs alone except for where you can substantially see through to the skin beneath. That'll mainly just be around the edges of hairlines. We're going to use the oil paint filter for the hair instead. Just go around, following the natural lines, making sure not to blur any hard lines too much so that they stay fairly sharp. We just want to smudge the texture really, not the lines. Also, I'm doing this real quick. Normally I'd take more time and be very detailed about it, but I just wanted to give you the idea. 
I'm gonna ignore the clothes in this example, but it's the same principles. Now, once you've got the skin smudged, we wanna make the hair look painted as well. To do this, first hide the smudge layer. Make another duplicate of the base layer. Go back to the oil paint filter. And now just focus on the hair. Get it to just the point where it looks painted, but it's not all blurred together, where you can still make out individual hairs. Then click OK. Now unhide the smudge layer and move the oil paint layer just above it. Add a layer mask to it and fill it with black to hide it. Then with a soft round brush set to white, paint back in only the hair. Now for a final touch, we're gonna to sharpen the image. Make a stamp visible layer of all visible layers. That's Shift Alt Control E on a PC or Shift Option Command E on Mac. Then go to Filter, Sharpen, Smart Sharpen. Set Remove to Gaussian Blur and make sure Reduce Noise is at 0%. We just wanna focus on the skin, so adjust the sliders until you start to see the skin start to sharpen, ignoring the hair. Click OK, add a layer mask, fill it with black, and just paint the sharpening onto the skin. If some places look over sharpened, just lower the flow and paint with black over those parts until you're satisfied with the look. And there's the before and after smudge painting. And here's the comparison to the oil paint filter. The next technique I'm gonna show you can be used in conjunction with smudge painting or by itself. And that's painting texture with the art history brush. I learned this technique over on the Texture Labs YouTube channel and they go into way more detail on it over there in their video. I'll leave a link to it and a couple of other fun related videos in the description. So this is a great way to add paint texture, like brush strokes and other imperfections that you get using a real paintbrush and paint that can really add a lot if you're going for a digital painting look. Now I don't use this technique in exactly the same way as they show in their video. I've sort of taken what they showed there and used it in a slightly different way. Let me show you. The first thing you're going to want to do is head over to the Texture Labs video. I've put a link down in the description to it. And from there, you can click the link to download the brushes I'm going to be using in this tip that they've so kindly provided. Once you've got them downloaded and unpacked, just double click on the .abr brush file and it'll show up in your brushes menu in Photoshop at the bottom of the list. After this, make a duplicate of the image you're working on by going to Image, Duplicate, and be sure to hit Duplicate Merged Layers Only. This will give you a new image file with all the layers from your main file flattened into one. Now, create four new layers and rename them Noodles, Small, Medium, and Large. Then go down and add a layer mask to each one of these new layers. Now go to the Brushes menu and select the Noodles brush and paint with it on the Noodles layer. Once you're done with that, invert the mask to hide it. Then do the same thing with the small brush then the medium brush, and finally the large brush. Now we want to paint back in the different brush effects with a white brush. You can use any brush you want. I like this textured brush, MA brush number 5-1. I don't recall exactly where this one came from, but I'm fairly certain I had to pay for it, so I wouldn't be able to make it available for you all to download. But you can find tons of free brushes on sites like DeviantArt and BrushEasy. Once you have a brush you want to use, put it on a lower flow and start masking the textures back onto the image. It's up to your creativity how you want it to look. After you're happy with it, the last step is to make the texture even more visible by sharpening it. Create a stamp visible layer of all the brush layers with Shift, Alt, Control, E on a PC or Shift, Option, Command, E on a Mac. And go up to Filter, Sharpen, Smart Sharpen, and just sharpen it as much as you'd like. 
You can always add a mask to this sharpened layer and use a soft brush on a low flow to remove the sharpening where it's too much. Next, I want to talk about how I color tone images. There are literally a kajillion ways you can change colors in Photoshop and they're all valid and useful and depending on the need, I'll use most all of them for one reason or another. But I want to show you the ones I use the most often for making big overall changes to colors in my artwork. First are custom actions. You can find millions of these online, both paid and free, with a quick Google search if you just search for Photoshop actions. It's up to your own taste and how you work which ones you'll want to use, or you can always make your own. I personally use actions created by photographer Laura Jade that are available for purchase on her website that I'll link to in the description. They're a bit on the pricier side and she's changed around the naming of her action bundles so I couldn't even tell you which bundle has the actions I actually use most often. But really, they're all pretty great for different things, so it'd be worth it to get any of them if you can swing it. If not, you can always find similar actions for free with a Google search or places like DeviantArt. If you do get Laura's bundles though, and they still have the same names, the three I use most often are Silver Eyes, Ethereal, and Lux. What's great about actions is that they'll often be adjustable after you run them. You can go and change the different adjustment layers used to create the effect and customize it to your liking. Next up are Curves Adjustments. Most people familiar with Photoshop know how to use curves to adjust contrast, because whenever you make a curves adjustment, it defaults to RGB and adjusts all the colors at once when you adjust the curve. But did you know that you can adjust the colors individually by clicking on RGB and selecting the individual colors? This gives you an immense amount of control. Play around with each color and see what you can do. Now, similar to curves is the color balance adjustment. When you first make a color balance adjustment, it'll be set to midtones. I always start with the highlights first, make my adjustments, then go to midtones, and then shadows. By default, the preserve luminosity box is going to be checked, but you can uncheck it and see if you like that result any better. Or you can always put this adjustment on the color blending mode if you want to only affect the colors and not the brightness levels of the image. Another tool I use for color toning in pretty much everything I do is color lookup tables using custom LUTs. LUTs are primarily used for color grading film and is how movies achieve the unique looks they often have. But did you know you can use these in Photoshop too? This was a game changer for me when I discovered it. To access them, just go to the adjustment layers option and select color lookup. Photoshop comes with a few of these built in by default. They're fine, but you can add custom ones as well. Like with Actions, there are millions of these available online, both free and paid. Just search for LUTs and find some you like. I've got hundreds of them in my library, but I primarily use the Cinematic LUTs pack from IWLTBAP. Link is in the description. These aren't free either, but they're not terribly expensive at $25 US for just the Cinematic pack or $40 for all three that they offer. To install lookup tables, all you have to do is move the folder containing the LUTs to where you have Photoshop installed on your computer under Presets, 3D LUTs. After that, just restart Photoshop and they should show up in the color lookup adjustment. Now, when I use these, I always put them on color blending mode. I usually already have the contrast in my image where I want it and don't want the LUTs to affect it. So using color blending will only affect the colors and not the brightness levels. And lastly for color toning, we have the Camera Raw Filter. This is an incredibly powerful tool that I had been using Photoshop for years and years before recognizing all it could do and implementing it into my regular workflow. Just create a stamp visible layer, shift alt Control e on PC, shift option command e on a Mac, then go to Filter, Camera Raw. Most everything you'll find in here is comparable, if not exactly, the kind of options you'll have in a raw photo editor such as Lightroom or Capture One. I'm not going to go through every tool in here, there's far too many, but I primarily use everything that's under this basic tab group. You can do so much with just these, even give your image a faux HDR look. I also frequently use the color grading tab to shift colors in midtones, highlights, and shadows. You can even save the changes you've made as a preset and apply them to future images. 
If you haven't used Camera Raw before, bust it open and play around with all the options. You'll be amazed with what all you can do in there. Okay, now for the one that I get asked about the most, the Glow Gradient Technique. Now before we get into it, it should be said that this is not my technique. I didn't come up with it. Everyone tells me it comes from Max Sabin, though I saw it in a video on the Photo Manipulation YouTube channel. I'll put a link to that one in the description. Now I haven't actually seen the Max Sabin one. If anyone knows which video it is where he first gives the technique, just let me know and I'll add it to the other links. Anyway, I just watched what they did in that video to create the effect and turn it into an action for myself. Don't ask me how it works though, because I don't know. Black magic. All I know is I love it and use it in pretty much every piece I make. It's perfect for making things glow and adding highlights to stuff, which is what I mostly use it for. So for example, after you've run the action, which I'll provide a link to down in the description, on this glow layer, take a white brush at a pretty low flow, maybe around 10% or so, and make the eye glow. Then create a new layer inside the glow gradient group and make some little light trails coming off of that glow if you want. Once you've got that done, you can then use the smudge brush to kind of smooth out some areas and adjust the shape a bit. Then click on the hue saturation layer, click colorize, turn up the saturation, and adjust the hue to change the color to whatever you want. For another example, you can use this technique to create highlights. So say you want a red highlight on this crow coming from the neon sign. Just paint the highlight. And if you need to, smooth it out with the smudge brush. Then change the color to red. And add a mask to the glow gradient group to erase where you need to. The last tip I want to mention is where to get stock images. There are a number of paid sites where you can get access to thousands upon thousands of stock images. You've got your Envato Elements, iStock Photo, Shutterstock, etc. Some are subscription based while others will let you access individual images for a one-time fee. The upside is you don't have to worry about copyright if you plan on selling artwork that uses any of these images in an obvious way. The other option is sites that offer royalty-free stock images such as Pexels, Pixabay, and Unsplash. However, I rarely find these sites useful as I'm usually looking for something incredibly specific, like a certain angle of a certain pose. The free sites can be somewhat limited in that regard. DeviantArt can also be a great resource for finding free stock images. You just have to check the user's info for limitations and attributions. So, finding royalty-free images is really only a necessity if you plan on selling your artwork that uses those images. If you're just using the images to practice or for demonstration, then you can actually use pretty much anything you find. I'd still stick to the old rule of changing the stock you use by at least 10 to 30%, just for the sake of artistic integrity, I guess. But it's not strictly necessary. With that being said, though, you're now able to use search engines like Google or Yandex to find images, which opens up a nearly infinite library of images to use. We probably won't need to do this anymore once AI gets a bit more user-friendly and you can generate exactly what you need simply and quickly. But for now, it's a good way to find just what you need to use for your artwork. Google is great, of course, especially when used in conjunction with Google Lens, like we saw in the first item of this list, to find high-quality stock photos. But another place I use equally as much is a Russian search engine called Yandex. What I love about Yandex is that you can find images in absolutely huge resolution and great quality, and you don't have to worry about having to convert them from that annoying .webp file type that you'll often end up with when downloading from Google. It also has a similar drag and drop reverse image search option similar to Google Lens, but it's been nowhere near as accurate in my use. But it's still a nice feature to have because when it does work, you can often find an even larger version of an image than what Google has. I use both search engines in conjunction with Topaz Gigapixel AI to have the best quality images to use in my artworks. And that's it. That's my list of the seven most useful tips and tricks that I regularly use in my own artwork. Please let me know how you think I did. I could really use the validation. Also, if you did like it, 
please, please, pretty please help me out by liking it, subscribing, and even sharing it with anyone else you know who might benefit from it. Thanks as always, and I'll see you all in the next video.